uh, I know you mentioned the State University of uh, the Ohio State University. Some of you don't know, but the official name of this university is the State University of Iowa. But we leave the state off because it's too confusing with that other school of names. <laughs> uh, Doug mentioned Tim Robertson. He was an influential faculty member in our department. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. He worked in research with Ed Wegman, and Ed Wegman's one of our very distinguished alumni. He's uh, very accomplished. He's the Bernard J. Dunn Professor of, what's the name of the department? Data Science and Applied Statistics at George Mason University. And Ed, I think you, did you found that department or organize it? Okay, all right. Uh, we're very happy to have you here. Let's jump on. mentioned, I uh, had an NDA fellowship um, uh, from the, from the get-go. Um, when I, as an undergraduate, I had sort of run out of courses to take in the math department, the undergraduate courses. So in, the, in my senior year, I started taking graduate courses. I had a year of abstract algebra. I had a year of topology. Um, a guy named Sam LaMonaco in 1961 from the math department at St. Louis University to Princeton and got a PhD in three years uh, on the topic of algebraic topology, in particular not there. So when he came back, he came back to St. Louis University and uh, was uh, wanting to teach this algebraic topology stuff. And I thought, that sounds pretty cool. I like topology. So, um, the department chair forced two of the people who are, who are already in candidacy to take this course. And I was a senior, and so I took it also. So there were three of us in this course with Sam. Uh, Sam wanted to teach out of a book in German, um, but uh, the department chairman didn't allow him to do that. Um, so the three of us took this course, and uh, I got the only A in the course. Two guys in Kansas City weren't too interested in, so they didn't do so well. So when I uh, applied uh, for graduate school here at Iowa, uh, there was a there was a, Steve Hormantrop was one of the topologists here, and I thought I was coming to a math department. The code for it was 22 in, in the spring of uh, 1965, and so I was all set and I was going to come here and study topology. Uh, turns out that um, um, I, I walked in in September and I had been notified that, the, that I was enrolled in the statistics department, which had split during the summer. Uh, I have two statistics, computer science, and plain math. So it was 22M was math, 22S was statistics, 22C was computer science department. Um, so I was sort of timid and wasn't, you know, wasn't very confident um, that what was going to happen to me. So I walked into the office and I was in a dilemma, which was about hope, about hog. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I thought, well, I, I better, better be careful. I'm, I'll say hope. Um, and so I walked in and talked to the secretary and I asked if well, Hogue was in. And I guess I said it in such a low voice that she looked up at me and she said, who? <laughs> and I said, oh, I must have made a mistake. It must, have, it must really be Hogue. <laughs> so I, in, in a slightly louder voice, asked if Bob Hogg was in. And just as I said that, he opened the door and walked out <laughs> and heard me. And so he said, I'm Bob Hogue. <laughs> um, so, so that was my first introduction to meeting Bob. Um, and I, as I said, I had the NDA fellowship, and I said, you know, I was expecting to be here and study algebraic topology. <coughs> he said, well, you know, your record is pretty good. Um, why don't you take the course in mathematical statistics, which was being taught by Ellen Craig? Um, I should say that. Uh, at St. Louis University, anybody who studied statistics was probably going to be a high school teacher. 
And so getting a statistician studying statistics was, you know, was for people who weren't really very good. Uh, so I, uh, I had this dilemma of uh, what was I going to do? And Bob said, well, you have the algebra and you also, you already have the topology, so you don't have to take those courses. Again. <laughs> you don't have real analysis, so why don't you take the course in real analysis? Uh, you, you can take Alan Craig's course. Uh, and the newly formed computer science department was chaired by Jerry Wade. Um, and Jerry was teaching a course in recursive function theory. And so Bob said, why don't you take this course, which is a sort of fundamental computer science course. Um, and so I, I agreed to, uh, to take this. Um, and I, I forget what other course, maybe it's set, uh, set theory, maybe it was the other course. Uh, so we had four courses in that semester. Uh, Jacobson was the professor who was teaching uh, the analysis course. Uh, and uh, I had made friends with a guy named Mike Cullen, who was a math major. Uh, he was sitting next to me on the Jacobson course. And uh, when we had the first exam, I got about a 35%. And Mike Cullen uh, had something like a 90%. And Mike and turns to me and he says, oh, this is pretty easy. <laughs> so he said, I don't see why I can't get all A's. And I thought to myself, well, if he can do it, I can do it too. Um, so I got to know Jerry Wheat pretty well. Now, Jerry turns out to have I've had a brain tumor, and he died a few years after we graduated. Uh, but I took several courses in the computer science department as well. Um, and so that, so I got to the point where I was going home for Christmas uh, break uh, at one stage, and I had taken a couple of courses with Tim Robertson, and I thought, well, I'm ready to start writing a dissertation, so this is a year and a half in. Um, and I asked Tim if he had a topic for me. Well, Tim was brand new. He was a very, you know, he was a he was a very junior assistant professor at the stage. Uh, but I thought he was a you know, fantastically good guy. Uh, and by the way, I should say, Alan's course uh, in mathematical statistics was very theoretically oriented. So I felt really good about it. You know, I changed my mind about statistics at that stage. But I was also into the computer science side of things. So I asked him if he had a topic for me. And uh, he sort of hemmed and hawed around and said, I don't know. Where, where. And so I thought, well, he's not going to take me on. So um, I went to the guy who I worked with in computer science. His name was Art Fleck. And I went to see Art Fleck before I left for the Christmas break. And I asked Art if he had a topic for me that uh, he, we might write on. And. Uh, so Art Flex sort of hemmed and hawed around and didn't give me any help. So I went home, uh, back to St. Louis, um, thinking that nobody wanted to work with me. I was really very depressed during the, the Christmas break. Anyway, I got back and um, saw Tim in the hallway, and Tim told me, well, I've been thinking about it, and I think I have a topic for you. And he described it to me. Uh, and so I thought, well, this is okay. And then, uh, then uh, about four hours later, I met Art Fleck, and Art Fleck said, I've been thinking about it, I think I have a topic for you. <laughs> and so I thought, oh my God, what do I do now? Um, so for about a month and a half, I was working on two different dissertations, one in statistics and one in computer science, um, and thinking, I can't sustain this. So I finally decided that I would uh, deal with uh, Tim's topic. Um, actually, um, you know, that was, that turned out to be a, a great thing, but, you know, Tim, Tim was into isotonic inference and uh, conditional expectations uh, under signal lattices and stuff like that, uh, very theoretical. 
sort of probabilistic orientation. And most of my training was here was um, you know sort of in what I would think of as probability kind of theory. Um, so I wound up um, doing this dissertation with Tim uh, and sort of you know going uh, away from the computer science side. But it turns out when I got to, I later went to Chapel Hill as my, as my faculty appointment. And I had a student I worked with, and we actually did the other dissertation as well. <laughs> so I have six papers in probabilistic automaton in random environments, um, as well as, uh, which sort of no, nobody in statistics knows about. Now, Doug, Doug had talked about the offices, um, and it was in the Clean Hall, which was, I think, in the, in the day we were there, it was called the Old Physics Building. And if you come in from the campus side, um, uh, it was kind of a split foyer kind of thing. So if you went upstairs, it was the first floor. You went downstairs, it was the basement. And below the basement was a sub-basement. And so the office that Dick Dykstra, myself, and Bob Miller had was under the men's restroom in the sub basement. <laughs> <laughs> and it did leak more than once during that, <laughs> time, uh, in that office. So it wasn't one of the most outstanding places um, that we, we ever had. So finally it came time for me to graduate. And uh, I had. I had been married the summer, uh, uh, yes, September before, uh, and so we had an apartment, 312D in West Benton Street, uh, and uh, I was driving down to, uh, to my final defensive dissertation, uh, and I had, I had a guy, you know, I was driving towards the campus, and I was a, a older fellow who had uh, a, a Nash Rambler, which was painted pink with house paint. Uh, and he made a left turn in front of me. And essentially, I crashed into him. So I was heartbroken. I was on my way to my final defense. And uh, so I called the police. And this guy had, had Alzheimer's disease, I guess. Uh, so I called the police. Um, and they came. And uh, I told them that I was scheduled for my defensive dissertation. And so the policeman told me to get in his police car. And so they drove me. <laughs> with the lights flashing in the second. <laughs> to, get to, my, to get to my final defense. Um, so that was. Um, Sort of some of my experiences. I had lots of other ones, but uh, um, so uh, I was nearing a point where I uh, thought that I should uh, go to the, go to what was then the annual meeting of the American Statistical Association, which was being held in Washington D.C. Uh, so he had booked a flight for us. And Tim Robertson was there as well, and we went. We flew in December, it was in December of 67. We flew out of the uh, Cedar Rapids Airport and it was on a four, four engine propeller plane that was going to Chicago. And we got on this plane and I had a window seat. Uh, and they cranked up the engines of this thing and a big flame shark were shooting out the backside of the airplane. Oh, this is not good. This was, this was actually the first time I had ever gone to a professional meeting, um, and so I was thinking that this is not good, this is not good. Uh, but anyway, we made it to, made it to uh, Washington, and, and Bob introduced me to a lot of people, uh, in, including uh, several people from UNC. So I interviewed, the first interview I had was with Jim Stapleton. That, uh, at Michigan State University, and that was still in December. Uh, we flew over the lake, and it was dark, and I thought, I'm not going to survive this either. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I interviewed uh, back at St. Louis University, and I 
interviewed at uh, University of Missouri, Rolla. I interviewed at Minnesota. Uh, and I interviewed at Chapel Hill. So my interview at Minnesota was on a Friday. Uh, and by the time I interviewed at Chapel Hill, um, the offer from Michigan State was sort of aging, and they were pressing me to make a decision. So I interviewed at Monday at, uh, at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And I remember uh, the, the first words out of my mouth during my, during my interview was, let H be a helper space. <laughs> uh, and so I'm not sure that UNC Chapel Hill is sort of an old fashioned school uh, with a lot of Brits and sort of traditional British kind of statistics. But anyway, I told them that I was being pressed to, to make a decision. Uh, and so they, so I interviewed on a Monday, and I got a telegram on Wednesday making me an offer to come. And I had told Bob that I wanted to go to a warm climate. Michigan, Minnesota, those were not places I wanted to go. Uh, so I took the job at Chapel Hill. Uh, and it was, it was an interesting place to be because it was, uh, you know, one of the top departments, and there were a lot of visitors, Ed Pearson and you know, many other distinguished statisticians uh, were there. Uh, when I took the job, there were nine full professors, and prior to my coming, there were nobody at the associate or assistant level. Mm -hmm. uh, and George Nicholson was the chairman at the time, and George had gotten a grant from the National Science Foundation. Uh, and he had authority to hire s s nine new faculty members. So we were in a situation with uh, nine full professors and nine assistant professors, mm -hmm. and nothing in between. And by the way, I should should say that um, I gra we graduated in June of 68, and uh, I was 24 when we graduated, when I graduated. I turned 25 in July, so, but um, of course the Vietnam War was on, and uh, I had registered with the draft board in St. Louis, and I had a 2A, two, two 2S student deferment. Uh, so I didn't go to North Carolina until uh, late August, um, so we were hanging around uh, Jefferson Hill, and I was keeping my mouth shut because I didn't want to lose my student deferment. Um, so uh, two days before I left for North Carolina, um, I mailed the information to the draft board that I had finished school. And, uh, uh, I was going to take the job in North Carolina. And this was two days before we left Iowa City. And before I actually left Iowa City, I got a notification from the draft board that I was reclassified 1A. Uh, and so, so I went to Chapel Hill uh, to start teaching and uh, with 1A classification, which is of course the most uh, eligible to be drafted. And 1968 was the year that was maximum troop deployment in Vietnam, and so uh, they were hurting, they wanted to draft people. And, uh, so I appealed that even though we had National Defense Education Act fellowship, mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to have me so we got around. Uh, so I so I appealed it to the board in St. Louis and the board in St. Louis didn't want to have it, they didn't want to change anything. Uh, so I appealed to the North Carolina Regional Board, and they gave me a 2A deferment. And so I thought, well, I'm not too bad off. Uh, but the St. Louis Board had ordered me to take a physical, to take a pre-deduction physical, in case I stopped working uh, in 2A deferment. So I was teaching a course, the junior level course on probability theory. Uh, 
bunch of 18 and 19 year old people. And, uh, and uh, we went to the, we were, I was ordered to go to the bus terminal in Chapel Hill, and they were going to take us to the armory in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, and so I, I wound up, much to my horror, most of the students in my class were also on this bus. <laughs> And so we got to the armory, um, and it turns out that uh, the way they did the physical exam was they had everybody lined up in a circle, stripped naked. Uh, the, there was a doctor on the inside who examined the front of you, and there was a doctor on the outside <laughs> examining on the back side of, of you. And so I'm standing there. Uh, sort of in the all together with a bunch of the students from this course. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, how can I go back and teach? <laughs> so we got on a Wednesday, um, and I went back in the classroom. Nobody said anything. <laughs> so they were probably just as embarrassed as I was. <laughs> One other quick story about uh, Chapel Hill days was so uh, the first. The first assignment I had was I was assigned to the examination committee for the comprehensive exams. Um, and I was, I was the only assistant professor that was on this committee. And um, so the, the procedure was that everybody on the committee had to um, make up an exam. Um, and so I, they accepted me because I had never taught a course there. So what happened was all these four professors were coming in and they have they have their exam and they pass the exam around and I looked at the first exam that came to my hands and I had no clue as to how to do this. <laughs> Not a clue. And I looked at the second one. Not a clue. <laughs> uh, third one. Not a clue. I think there were six of them. And I had no idea how to do any of these things. <laughs> The training at Chapel Hill was different from Iowa. Um, so um, I'm thinking, boy, if they find out I don't know any of this stuff, <laughs> I'm never gonna I'm never gonna get tenure here. So it turns out that after the exam, I think the highest score of any of the students was about 35%. And uh, so um, it turns out that None of the other faculty knew how to solve the problems either. <laughs> <laughs> the professors didn't know how to do it either, except their own. And so they made a rule after that that uh, if you set an exam question, you also have to give the answer to the <laughs> exam question. So that was my time in Chapel Hill. Uh, uh, in 1976 77, I was eligible for sabbatical. Oh, I should say that. Uh, uh, George Nicholson um, was um, kind of a visionary guy, um, but he wasn't a great scholar. He, he was well connected in Washington, D.C., and he had had a, a procedure for getting grant money. And so when I first got there, he would have the other faculty members write up some stuff that they wanted to do, and then he would put it.